Our normal colloquium chair is not here, Daniel. However, I will uh, do the introductions. Uh, our speaker today, Jasper Alicaz, is going to be giving you a little bit of space physics, which is good. It'll be good for you. Um, and uh, Jasper got his undergraduate degree at the University of Washington quite a few years ago. I don't like dates anymore. Um, he got his PhD at University of California, Berkeley, and then for many years worked in the space science lab here at Berkeley, if anyone knows the place. It's, it's up the hill above the Warren's Room War now, and another couple of switchbacks on that road. Uh, and then the last couple of years, he has been uh, at the University of Iowa Physics Department, and uh, he's done a lot of work on several <coughs> space missions and data sets. Uh, I'm familiar with him from his work on Mars. And actually, I thought he was going to talk about Mars originally, but evidently not. Uh, uh, he's actually going to be talking about the uh, uh, plasma in the vicinity of the moon. So, uh, Jasper, the floor is yours. Thank you, Tom. And uh, thanks, everyone, for having me today. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, as Tom said, I haven't been in the Midwest for too long, so this is my first opportunity to come down to uh, Kansas. And it's a pleasure to, uh, to visit your institution. Um, I figured you guys were probably all tired about hearing about Mars from Tom, so that's why I decided to talk about the moon instead of Mars. Um, but you'll see if I made the right choice or not. Uh, so I want to just uh, introduce this talk by talking a little bit about magnetic fields throughout the solar system. And there really are magnetic fields throughout the solar system. It seems to be uh, almost a universal in our solar system, um, working outwards from the sun to Mercury. Uh, notice I skipped Venus. We don't think there's a lot of strong fields at Venus. Um, but there is a strong intrinsic field at Earth. And then uh, all of the, uh, the giant outer planets seem to have a strong intrinsic magnetic field. Uh, there are even some moons which have strong intrinsic magnetic fields, like Ganymede, which is a moon of Jupiter. Um, there are some notable exceptions on this list. Uh, we don't have uh, all eight or nine planets, depending on how you count. Venus, as far as we can tell, does not have a strong intrinsic permanent magnetic field today. Mars also does not, but almost certainly once did. We can see remnants on the surface of Mars. We can see uh, regions of magnetized rocks on the surface, which suggest that there used to be a strong magnetic field there. Um, the moon also does not presently have strong magnetic fields. But as we'll see, it has some localized magnetic fields as well. Uh, Pluto. We may never know. They did not fly a magnetometer on New Horizons. Uh, so uh, we probably will never know, or at least not for a long, long time, uh, whether or not Pluto has an intrinsic magnetic field. Um, but there are a lot of magnetic fields in the solar system. And uh, why are these magnetic fields interesting? Well, they're interesting for their, for their own right. It's interesting to understand how they're generated. They're generated by convection and current systems in the interior uh, of these bodies. Um, but these magnetic fields are also interesting because they interact with the plasma flowing out from the sun. Uh, so here's a uh, stylized image of the sun and the magnetic field of the Earth, not quite to scale. Uh, but uh, the point here is that the Earth and its magnetic fields are constantly bombarded by plasma from the sun. Plasma flows out from the sun uh, in the form of primarily ionized hydrogen, a little bit of ionized helium, and some other heavier elements flown, thrown in uh, for good measure. And it flows out from the sun at around 300 to 500 kilometers a second, um, or about a million miles per hour. That's a real unit, one of my favorite canonical units of space physics. It really is a million miles per hour. Uh, and it's fairly tenuous stuff. It's somewhere in the realm of 1 to 20 particles per cubic centimeter, so nothing like an atmosphere. It's very tenuous. And because it's so tenuous, it's nearly collisional. Um, your average solar wind hydrogen ion traveling all the way from the Earth, from the sun rather, to the Earth undergoes about one collision in that time one Coulomb collision. So uh, collisions are not um, what transmit information through the medium. Instead, plasma waves and things like that transmit energy through the medium. Um, this plasma is hot. It's got a temperature of around 100,000 degrees Kelvin. Um, it wouldn't feel that hot if you put your hand much of it. There's not a lot of collisions to transmit that heat. Uh, the characteristic scale of this plasma, there's a couple characteristic scales, and we'll talk about them. Um, but it's on the order of around 100 kilometers. 
So uh, when this plasma interacts with the Earth's magnetic field, Earth has a strong global magnetic field, this plasma comes in and it is largely diverted around the magnetic field of the Earth. Um, there's a shock wave which is formed because this plasma is flowing at supersonic speeds and most of this solar plasma gets diverted around uh, the Earth's magnetic, magnet magnetic, magnetic field. Can't say magnetic for some reason. Um, so this is, this is what things look like when you have a strong intrinsic magnetic field like the Earth. Um, but we're not going to talk about the Earth, we're going to talk about the Moon, uh, which on this picture would be like one of these little dots here, which are actually supposed to be stars, I think. Uh, but the Moon is, uh, is about the size and distance of one of these little dots back here. So, the Moon. Um, before we visited the Moon, we thought that it was too small to have ever had an internal dynamo, to have ever had vigorous convection that would sustain a magnetic field. So we assumed that there would be no magnetic field on the Moon. Um, Forty-five odd years ago, we learned that we were wrong. There are magnetic fields on the Moon, and with the Apollo subsatellites and the Explorer missions uh, and other spacecraft of that epoch, we saw these magnetic fields. What we saw was that there is not a strong intrinsic global dipole magnetic field like the Earth, uh, but what there are are little patches of magnetized crust on the surface. And these are uh, maps made by the Apollo sub-satellites using two different techniques, uh, which we're going to discuss. One of these techniques involves just making a measurement of the magnetic field at the spacecraft altitude. And you can see that the magnitude of the field that you were seeing at spacecraft altitude of around 100 kilometers was on the order of a fraction of a nanotesla. Very, very weak fields. We're standing in about 50,000 nanotesla right now on the surface of the Earth. So these are exceedingly weak fields compared to anything that you see on the Earth. Um, through another te technique, which I'll discuss in a minute, electron reflectance, we were able to see that the fields near the surface are a bit stronger than that, on the order of tens uh, to perhaps 100 nanotesla. Um, with the Apollo sub-satellites, which had an equatorial orbit, we basically were only able to map a band of these magnetic fields around the equator. Um, where I came into this picture, though, was uh, the Lunar Prospector mission, which was launched in the late 90s, uh, right around when I was starting graduate school. And uh, this was a dedicated mission to map the magnetic field and to map elemental composition and other aspects of the Moon. This is Lunar Prospector. Um, Hardy little spacecraft, very simple spinner with uh, all of the science experiments on these three booms here. The science experiments included a, uh, a neutron spectrometer, a gamma ray spectrometer, an alpha particle spectrometer, and uh, the payload that I worked on most closely, which was a magnetometer and an electron instrument. Um, this was the magnetic field map that we returned from that mission. Since it was a polar orbiter, we were able to make a complete map of the magnetic field. And what I'm showing you here is the magnitude. Um, blue is high, pink is low for reasons that I don't understand. Um, I didn't write this paper. Um, and then this is the polarity of the magnetic field uh, in two components. This would be the uh, radial component, and this would be the azimuthal component of that magnetic field that we measured from orbit. And what you see is that the distribution of magnetic fields on the Moon is highly inhomogeneous. Um, it's over on the far side, the fields tend to be strong, but they're very patchy in scale. On the near side, they're somewhat weaker and even more patchy in scale. And if you look at the polarity of the fields, um, it's up and down, in and out, all over the place on a lateral scale of only a few degrees. So if you walked around on the surface of the moon with a compass, it would be useless to you. The needle would be going back and forth every five or 10 kilometers. Um, it would not be a useful way for you to get around. There's another way that we can use to measure these magnetic fields. Uh, this magnetic field map, uh, although you can't quite see the color bar down here, goes up to uh, about 10 nanotesla. So this is the field at around 50 kilometers altitude. So if you're 50 kilometers off the surface, you're measuring fields which go up to 10 nanotesla or so. Um, but these are highly inhomogeneous fields, so it makes you think that perhaps at the surface they could be a bit stronger. Uh, so how do you measure them at the surface? Well, of course, what you'd like to have is put a magnetometer down on the surface and do that, but uh, that involves landing things, which is hard on the moon. Uh, so a technique that we used is called uh, electron reflectance. Yes? How is it, how is it related to, to astronomy? To astronomy? 
Ah, excellent question. Excellent question. Um, this is oriented um, in terms of the rotational axis of the moon. So North Pole, South Pole, and the moon essentially rotates with its equator in the ecliptic, which is also essentially the plane of its orbit around the Earth. Um, the moon, of course, is phase locked, so we always see the same side of the moon. Its, uh, its day is the same as its uh, uh, month, and so we're always looking at this side of the moon. This is the side of the moon that's always facing away from the Earth. Uh, are you asking about how these coordinates are oriented? I'm just looking at the range. Um, let's see. Is it, is, it, is it any blue up at the top or bottom? Ah, I see what you're asking. You're asking whether the, the strong fields are correlated uh, near the equator or near the poles. Yeah. Um, the very strongest fields are a little ways off of the South Pole, probably 20, 30 degrees of latitude off of the South Pole. There's none of the very strongest fields are at the pole, but it's also not zero. Um, so I would say that there's not a clear uh, trend one way or the other. But I'll show you another map in a second with a different projection, which maybe will allow you to see this a little bit better. Okay, so this is, this is the map that you get just measuring the magnetic field at spacecraft altitude. Kind of a straightforward thing to do. You circle around the planet, you measure the magnetic field, you make a map out of it. Uh, a slightly more complicated thing that you can do is you can look at the distribution of low energy electrons that you measure at altitude. And low energy electrons, it turns out, um, do a very good job of probing the magnetic field for you. And if this doesn't sound obvious to you, uh, it shouldn't necessarily sound obvious because the discovery that this technique worked was completely accidental. What they did was they put an electron instrument on the Apollo subsatellites, and this was supposed to be the only instrument on the Apollo subsatellites that was not going to measure the moon. What they thought they were going to do with this instrument was they were going to use the moon as an occulter, and they were going to look at flows in the Earth's magnetotail um, by looking at the occultation of electrons. But what they found was that there are electrons coming from the surface. And what they eventually realized was that what was happening was that as they were flying in orbit over the moon, there's always electrons around from the solar wind or from the Earth's magnetosphere or wherever you happen to be. Some of those electrons head down towards the surface. Um, if they make it to the surface, they're mostly absorbed. They mostly don't come back. But if they run into a strong concentration of magnetic fields, some of those electrons can be reflected adiabatically and come back up to you. So by measuring the ratio of electrons that come back up over electrons that go down, you get a very straightforward measure of strength of magnetic field. And the cool thing about that is that it's a measure of the magnetic field at the surface rather than at altitude. So it allows you to use the electrons to run down to the surface, come back, tell you what the magnetic field strength is there. So using that, um, question. All of this magnetism is um, carried in uh, minerals near the surface, yes. Um, whether it's truly pure ferromagnetism or whether it's pseudo single domain uh, magnetism, people argue about what the actual phase is and what the carriers are. Um, but yes, this is permanent magnetism which is emplaced in minerals which are um, at or near the surface. And the, and the coherence scale is something like a few kilometers squared or whatever. We'll come to that, but yes, that, that is correct. Okay. Um, maybe even smaller than that. Um, but I, I'll have a slide on that in just a minute, which uh, uh, I hope to. Uh, elucidate that a little bit more. Um, but yes, very small scale. Okay, so uh, let's see what the electrons tell us about the magnetic field. And now um, this is the strength of the magnetic field at the surface rather than at the spacecraft. And uh, I'm using a slightly different projection here. What I've done is I've spread out um, plus 60 to minus 60 latitude in a cylindrical projection. And then I've got the poles projected separately in a different projection. So now this should help answer your question about whether there's magnetism near the poles or not. Uh, and in some cases, there are some chunks of uh, relatively significant magnetism near the poles, um, but nothing like this strong uh, stuff on the far side. 
so this is a log scale in magnetic field. Um, the purples are a few tenths of a nanotesla. The reds are up to a few hundreds of a nanotesla. Uh, and so again, you can see that uh, the field is extremely inhomogeneous. And it's inhomogeneous on very small scales. You know, each, each pixel element here is uh, uh, a degree, which is about 30 kilometers across. So you're looking at variations um, in tens of kilometers or less, which are significant in magnetic field strength. Um, so uh, an excellent question is how you get this distribution of magnetic field. The answer is we really don't know yet. Um, the leading theory is that the moon used to have a dynamo and that this is some sort of fossil imprint of that dynamo. Um, but they, they're, there are naysayers, of which I am one, who say that you can't explain this whole distribution just with an ancient lunar dynamo. Um, that, however, is not really going to be the subject of this talk. Uh, so, that, question. That is an interesting question. It is an interesting question. Uh, a priori, I think, but, but that's, that would be more mysterious than, than magnetized rock at random. So there's a lot of coherence in this picture, and there's, someone must have expanded it in spherical harmonics and looked at the, at the dipole. Mm -hmm. So it, is the dipole lined up with this in any way with the There's, if you do uh, expand this in a spherical harmonic uh, expansion, which people have done, there is almost no dipole term. That's the first thing. Um, and if I go back a few slides and show you this map of the polarities, I think you can see why that is. You know, there's, there's no uh, uh, zeroth or first order spherical harmonic that's apparent in this distribution. Uh, your polarity is going back and forth over much smaller scales than that. Um, what you can do, and this is getting way off topic, but what you can do is you can go in and do local spherical harmonic uh, expansions or dipole fits or things to local patches of magnetization and try and extract a paleopole. Um, and people have done this, uh, and the results are not very convincing, frankly. On the last slide that you did, um, the circles this one? are where the craters are, I assume? Or? Yes, the, the white circles are where the big craters are, and the black circles are the regions of the moon opposite to those big craters. So uh, it it may be a complete coincidence that there are some black circles near these strong magnetic fields, but it's almost certainly not a coincidence that the two youngest large impact basins have very weak fields, um, and that should make sense. If you have a huge impactor that comes in and bashes the surface and heats it up and shocks it, it's going to destroy the magnetization. So what this pattern probably tells you is that most of this stuff was in place before these two large impacts, which dates at around 3.9 plus billion years ago. Okay, so a question was asked about the coherent scale of this stuff. Um, so we actually have three different measurements which can help us get at that coherent scale. One of them is the magnetometer measurements at 30 kilometers or so altitude. There's the electrons that run down and tell you about the field at the surface. Those are uh, limited in the spatial scale that they can resolve because they follow little spirals around uh, the field, and you can't do much better than the width of that spiral, which in the case of the electrons that we're using is around 10 kilometers or so. Um, we do have a few points of ground truth because on a few of the Apollo uh, landed missions, uh, we took down uh, what we called a lunar surface magnetometer and we did some measurements with that. Um, when they took this magnetometer and walked it around on the surface, when they took it a distance of a few kilometers, the field went from like this to like this. So getting back to a question from the audience, the coherence scale of this stuff is almost certainly uh, a few kilometers or less at the surface. So when we look at, at it with the mag magnetometer up at altitude, we're seeing a heavily averaged version of that. It's very aliased over that small scale coherence. And even when we look at it with the electrons, we're probably averaging over a lot of um, small scale structure. So this stuff is very, very incoherent on the surface. Okay. so. Now to get into the kind of the main point of the talk, how does this lunar environment interact with the plasma that's coming in? Well, um, the moon 
is commonly thought of as being a completely airless and unmagnetized body. Um, I study the atmosphere and magnetic field of the moon, so uh, I'm not sure what that says for me. Um, but <laughs> uh, one thing that is for sure is that the surface of the moon is pretty unshielded from the environment around it. The, uh, the plasma and uh, other sources of, of energy that are coming in are free to hit the surface and interact with it. <clears throat> So there's a lot of energy coming from the sun. There's the solar wind that we've been talking about. There are, of course, lots and lots of photons of various wavelengths. There are energetic particles and things like that. Um, once a month during full moon, the moon goes through the Earth's magnetosphere, and there are uh, terrestrial sources of plasma which are hitting the surface. All of that bombardment does a lot of interesting things. One thing that it does is that it charges up the surface. If you bombard the surface with charged particles, you can charge it up, especially if there's an imbalance between the different charged particles, which there tends to be because the electrons are faster and more of them hit the surface. So uh, you can get uh, charging. You can also get charging because of photo emission driven by UV sunlight. So depending on where you are on the moon, whether you're in sunlight or in shadow, the surface can charge up. In the sunlight, it tends to charge to tens of volts positive. In the shadow, it can charge up to hundreds of volts negative. So this is very interesting. Another thing that happens is that a wake forms because all of this plasma from the sun is flowing by at supersonic speeds, and a lot of it gets, uh, hits the day side and either gets absorbed or bounces off, uh, leaving a wake downstream. So in terms of plasma density, this wake downstream of the moon is one of the lowest density regions in the solar system. It's extremely low plasma densities. Uh, and so there's all kinds of interesting dynamics associated with how the plasma gets back into that wake. And then the other thing that's very interesting is when the solar wind impacts one of these small scale magnetic regions. Uh, and so for the next 20, 30 minutes, uh, I want to focus on just what happens when the solar wind comes and interacts with one of these very incoherent regions of magnetization on the surface. Before doing that, uh, I want to just say that the moon is really small, all right? This is not the moon, this is the Earth. This is the Earth and its magnetosphere. Uh, and these um, units here are, what are these units? These are tens of thousands of kilometers, I believe. Uh, the, the Earth here, this is actually not the Earth. This is a circle which is six times the radius of the Earth. Uh, they had to cut off their inner simulation boundary there. And uh, this is the shock which is formed by the interaction of the Earth's magnetic field with the solar wind. Solar wind comes in from right to left, encounters this obstacle because it's supersonic. Uh, there's a shock wave which is formed. And you can see that there is all kinds of heating and there's all kinds of turbulence formed in the sheath region downstream from this shock. And also in some regions of the upstream region where particles reflect off of this shock and can go back upstream. Um, so this is the Earth, um, already very complicated. Let's throw in uh, Mars just for Tom's sake. So uh, this is the magnetosphere of Mars to scale. Uh, I'll expand that a little bit. And you can see that uh, Mars in a lot of ways looks very similar to the Earth, just a much um, smaller version of the same thing. Again, uh, we've got a bow shock here. Again, we've got compression here. The density goes up downstream of that bow shock. Um, because this is data rather than the simulation, you can't see the individual little wiggles and turbulent things going on in the sheath. Uh, but the picture looks very similar to the Earth, just a lot smaller. All of this fits into this little postage stamp here. The moon is still smaller yet. So this is the moon to scale on the graph with Mars. And we're not even going to look at the interaction with the whole moon. We're going to look at the interaction with one of these tiny little crustal magnetic fields on the corner of the moon. So we're looking at something that is way, 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 way smaller than the interaction with the Earth. It's very, very small. Um, in fact, it's so small that it is comparable to the intrinsic plasma scales. So just to... Uh, give you some numbers, some of which you may already know, some of which you may not. The, the lunar radius is about 1,740 kilometers. Uh, so it's about uh, four times smaller than the Earth in radius, of course, which makes it a whole lot smaller in uh, volume. 
The magnetic anomalies are quite a bit smaller than that. Uh, as we saw, the big patches of strong fields might cover 10 to uh, perhaps a few hundred kilometers. Um, and the coherent scale of those is very small uh, on the order of a kilometer or less. So you might have a patch of magnetic field that's like a few hundred kilometers across. Across that patch, the polarity might be going all over the place. If you compare this to typical plasma scales, there's a couple plasma scales you might be interested in. Um, one is the ion inertia length. That's sort of the characteristic length of oscillations in the plasma uh, of, the, of one of the basic plasma wave modes. That's about 100 kilometers in the solar wind. Um, another scale that you might be interested in is the gyro radius of a solar wind proton. Um, in other words, how big the scale of gyration of that proton is in the typical solar wind magnetic field. That's about 500 kilometers. So what you see here is that these magnetic anomalies are comparable to or perhaps even smaller than the intrinsic scales of the plasma. So this would be like um, in gas dynamic terms, like if you had an obstacle which was smaller than your mean free path. You can imagine that lots of interesting things might happen. Uh, and lots of interesting things happen in the lunar case. So let me start with the, the baseline solar wind interaction and then we'll get into the magnetic anomalies in a second. Um, so here's my lunar surface. Here's the solar wind coming in from left to right. Over most of the moon, uh, this is a sample of the observations that you might have. Uh, I'm going to show several of these uh, energy spectrograms, so I want to unpack this a little bit. Uh, what you're looking at here is time on the horizontal axis, energy on the vertical axis, and then this color is essentially flux. It's the number of particles at that energy. And uh, these are measurements from a Japanese spacecraft called Kaguya, and um, there's one side of this instrument which is facing away from the moon, looking at what's coming towards the moon, and there's one which is looking at what is coming away from the moon. And when you come around to the North Pole, uh, both of these see the solar wind. But when you're over the day side, this whole region here, what you see is the solar wind hydrogen, the solar wind helium, and then if you look towards the moon, there's a little bit of stuff coming back. And it turns out that uh, around somewhere around 1% of the solar wind just bounces off of the surface in charged form. <coughs> so when a, uh, a 1 kilovolt hydrogen ion comes down and hits the surface, something like 0.1 to 1% of those actually come off and keep their identity as a hydrogen plus ion. Most of them, on the other hand, uh, lose their charge and they come back in the form of a neutral hydrogen. So around 20 to 30 percent, or perhaps 100 percent, depending on who you talk to on a given day, uh, of these solar wind protons come in, and if they hit the surface, they lose their charge, become a neutral hydrogen, and they come back off with a degraded energy distribution. So this would be the solar wind energy distribution coming in. This would be the degraded energy distribution of the reflected neutral hydrogen. Cool thing about this, it was actually seen first by a mission called IBEX, which was nowhere near the moon. IBEX was actually looking outward, trying to map ENAs from the outer heliosphere, and it saw this signal from the moon. Turns out to be the brightest signal that they see in their data. Uh, so just goes to show if you build a good instrument, you'll, uh, you'll see things you didn't anticipate. OK, so this is what happens in a region where there's no magnetic fields on the surface. This is essentially the interaction with the unmagnetized surface. Solar wind comes in, some of it comes off, most of that comes off in neutral form. But what if we put one of these tiny little magnetic fields in there? Well, um, if you were going to make a prediction about this, and I did make predictions about this 10 or 15 years ago, uh, which were completely wrong, uh, I would have said that nothing would happen. I would have said that the solar wind would basically not see these magnetic fields because uh, the gyro radius of these solar wind protons is big compared to these magnetic fields. And so my line of thinking would have been, there's no way this magnetic field is going to force the solar wind to bounce off and not hit the surface. So it's just pretty much going to look like an unmagnetized region of the surface. I would have been wrong. I was wrong. Actually, lots of this comes off. So this, again, is a map of the far side of the moon. And this is a map now of the reflection rate of these solar wind protons. 
and you can see that there is a significant fraction of the moon where that reflection rate is up into the 30, 40, uh, 50, even topping out at about 60% over the strongest region of magnetic fields. So there's something that we didn't expect to see here. These magnetic fields, which are so small and so incoherent uh, compared to the plasma scales, are somehow still reflecting all of these particles uh, and keeping them from hitting the surface. Lest you think that this measurement um, just isn't trustworthy, there's another way that we can see this, which is a little bit more subtle. It's to look at the ENAs once again. Now, if you're reflecting the solar wind before it hits the surface, then it can't interact with the surface and lose its electron, or sorry, gain an electron and become neutral. So it can't form a neutral hydrogen coming back out. And indeed, if we make a map of the neutral proton or the neutral hydrogen flux coming back from the surface, what you see is that there's a big hole in these strong magnetic anomaly regions. Um, there's also what looks to be a ring around the edge of that magnetic anomaly region. So it seems that what's happening is the solar wind is coming in and it's being deflected over this region of magnetic anomalies and you're getting actually uh, a void there where nothing can get to the surface and then kind of a little halo around the edge where the stuff gets deflected down around the edges of that. So both of these tell you that these magnetic fields actually have significant effects on the solar wind, though uh, a naive prediction would have said that they should not. What balances the charge? What balances the charge? That is a fabulous question. Um, the good or bad thing, depending on your perspective, is that um, there is enough UV photo emission from the surface that there's almost an endless reservoir of electrons from the surface. So balancing the charge is not necessarily a problem, but it does make you think about you know, what electric fields and so forth are going to be generated by that interaction. And I think that that's a very relevant question, and it's, frankly, it's one that the field is still grappling with. We don't measure electric fields, except in, the, in, the, in, the, in calculations in the, in the plasma field. We don't measure electric fields um, directly in most cases. Um, we actually can measure electric fields around the spacecraft in some cases, but that doesn't tell you what's going on down at the surface. Uh, there are limited cases in which we can use the electrons to tell us what the integrated potential drop is. Uh, so sometimes we can glean some information about the electric fields. Um, bear with me for another two slides or so because the electric fields are going to be important here. Okay, so this is uh, a, a local region of the moon. Um, you can do mapping. Uh, of the moon, and you can map the moon in uh, different emissions uh, or reflections if you like. Uh, so this bottom right panel, I'm going to start here, this is the electron reflection map. So this is a map of electron reflection, here's a map of proton reflection, and then these are maps of the uh, ENA. So these are maps of protons that have made it to the surface and been neutralized and come off as hydrogen. Uh, so these maps are kind of like a negative of these two maps, you'll see, because these are maps that are telling you that there are shielded regions, whereas these are maps that are telling you that things are reflecting off of those shielded regions. Now one thing that is remarkable about these maps, in my opinion, is that the uh, electron reflection map looks exactly like the proton reflection map. Despite the fact that the electron scales are uh, at least 40 times, sometimes uh, even more than 40 times smaller than the proton scales, and yet these maps look exactly the same. Even in these very small little magnetic fields, you know, little bumps and dribs and drabs up here look exactly the same on the electron and the ion maps. So it makes you think what this gentleman here has just asked about, which is that electric fields must be very important. Um, the Japanese, again, have something to say about this. Uh, what they've been able to do is they've been able to fly at very low altitudes through some of these magnetic anomalies, um, very low altitudes like nine kilometer altitudes, which uh, um, if you think about lunar topography is remarkable because there are nine kilometer mountains on the moon. Um, but anyway, they've been able to do this without running into one of those mountains. And uh, what they found was the following. Uh, this now again is an energy spectrum, but it's for electrons and this is for ions, and then this is the strength of the magnetic field as they were flying through it. And what they found was this interesting feature, which is the, the electrons are getting accelerated uh, 
the ions are getting decelerated as they go through one of these regions. And so what seems to be happening is that the magnetic fields are reflecting the electrons. The electrons reflect really well in magnetic fields because they follow tight little spirals around the field line. But once those electrons reflect, you have a problem with charge. And uh, that forces the ions to follow. Um, so though in plasma physics, you often think of ions as driving the bus because they have all the momentum, in this case, it's really the electrons that are forcing things to happen because the magnetic fields are reflecting the electrons and those guys are forming an electric field which drags the ions back with them. So um, we were all right when we thought that these magnetic fields couldn't reflect the ions, but they can reflect the electrons and that produces an electric field that reflects the ions. Uh, and this is uh, uh, just a graph which shows that the amount of energy that the protons lose in this field is equal to the amount of energy that the electrons gain. So it's uh, roughly consistent with a quasi-static electric field of some kind. Um, that's not to say that there's not some AC compound to all of this, but to first order it seems like there's some kind of electric field and it's at very low altitudes. I mean, we're talking um, tens of kilometers here above the surface that this electric field does its work. So this is just, um, you know, a cut through this interaction. It's whatever trajectory the spacecraft happened to follow. Um, to get a more global context, it's, like it's useful to look at simulations. So this is a, uh, a particle and cell simulation. What that means is that they actually track each electron and each ion, uh, which makes it incredibly computationally expensive. Um, and they can't run very many of these simulations because of that, and they can't run ones that are very big. This whole simulation box is one ion inertia length across, which means it's about 100 kilometers across and 50 kilometers tall. Uh, you can see the magnetic field geometry that they've put in here. They've got some little closed loops of magnetic field. And then up, up above, they've got some kind of external field, which is the opposite direction. Uh, so you have this funny kind of null point geometry here. And uh, you can see that down at the very lowest altitudes uh, where um, these field lines are essentially closed at both sides, they connect to the surface at both ends, uh, there is a strong feature in the density that gets set up. So there is an increased density of the electrons with a little void inside of that, and there's an increased density in the ions and a little void inside of that. What is not so obvious from looking at this is that these density enhancements are a little bit offset from each other, and so if you looked at Ne minus Ni, you'd see a little region there where it's non-quasi-neutral, and that's where all the electric field action is. It, yeah, it, it unfortunately does not include anything from the surface. The surface is just an absorber, which is not very physically realistic. And I keep parping on this to these guys, and they haven't put anything in there yet because then they have to rerun their simulation. But uh, at present, this is just the solar wind coming in, and if it hits the surface, um, it doesn't even accumulate charge. It just goes away. Not in vigorous agreement, yes. Uh, I 100% agree with that. At the kind of typical uh, energies that we're talking about, secondary emission can be order of unity even. Yep, no, I, uh, I completely agree. Um, to my knowledge, no one has done that for anything other than a 1D simulation yet, which is unfortunate, because you can't really do magnetic field geometry in 1D. <laughs> uh, OK, so what happens? to incoming particles in this simulation. Well, if you want to look at the electric field now, this is the uh, electric field which is uh, formed in this simulation. You can see that down in this region where you're getting density enhancements and things, there's a strong electric field formed. And if you look at particles that come in uh, and come back out through that, um, they're really getting reflected right in that region of strong uh, electric field. So, so far the simulations are consistent with this picture whereby uh, it's the electric field that's really the workhorse that's turning these uh, solar wind protons around. Okay, uh, 
though there's, cer there's certainly a null point, yeah. yeah. Should in principle be, yeah, I agree, I agree. Um, there was another paper which looked at a similar geometry here to this that talked about things like reconnection happening in this region. This particular paper didn't. Um, I haven't tracked down the, the difference there between those two approaches, but um, uh, I agree it's certainly something you, you would think about here. Okay. Um, I want to bring um, a little bit more of, of what I've done into this now. Uh, there is a mission we have around the moon now called Artemis, which actually makes um, probably the most, well, certainly the most comprehensive uh, plasma measurements that we've yet had at the moon. Um, cool thing about this mission, it was uh, not a mission that was originally proposed. It was a mission that we basically manufactured because what we did was we took two probes from a heliophysics mission called Themis and we discovered that at the end of their prime mission they had just enough propellant to take them to the moon. So we took them and we sent them to the moon. It was, it was a really nice piece of creating something out of nothing was what it was. Um, they're actually still at the moon. Uh, the two Artemis probes are still orbiting today. We've got scads of data from them. Um, and it's a very complete set of plasma data because we've got uh, low energy ion and electron data, energetic uh, electrons and ions, um, DC and low frequency magnetic field measurements. And we also have high frequency magnetic field measurements and we have DC up to high frequency electric fields. Now, electric field measurements in space plasma are a tricky business, so um, uh, I'm not actually going to get too much into those today, um, but this is a, a really excellent data set for doing this. Um, the only trick with Artemis is that we're not in a circular orbit around the moon. We did not have enough uh, fuel to get into a circular orbit, so we're in a highly elliptical orbit, which means that we just zip through periapsis real quick and see a glimpse of the moon. But since we do that once a day and we have two probes and they've been up there since 2011, we have a bunch of zips by the moon real close. So let's look at what that looks like. Um, this is uh, an orbit track across the surface of the moon. The gray scale in the background is the crustal magnetic field strength from the electron reflection map. Um, the strong far side anomalies are kind of over here on the corner. We're actually over on the side in this one. And uh, I'm showing you now, um, we're measuring the reflected protons coming off of the surface. And these vectors are telling you what direction they're going. So they're kind of spraying off from the surface in all directions. And we're measuring them as we go overhead. Uh, the magnetic fields that we're flying over are somewhat pedestrian. They're not even the strongest crustal magnetic fields. So these are th what you would predict from just the crustal magnetic fields. What we actually measure is a whole lot more disturbed. So these fields are about five, six, uh, in this case, almost 10 times higher than just the crustal magnetic field alone. So these are not unmodified un crustal magnetic fields. These are heavily warped and contorted magnetic fields, and there's probably some solar wind uh, mixed in there as well. As you fly over this region, you can measure the solar wind density, and you can also measure the density of stuff that's reflecting off of the moon. So this over here is this kind of weak reflection off of unmagnetized surface. This is the 0.1 to 1% kind of thing. And then we get near these strong magnetic anomalies, and it suddenly goes up to around 30% of the solar wind. So this is the strong reflection off of a magnetic anomaly. And then notice what happens to the solar wind here. Right when we get just past this reflection point, the solar wind suddenly jumps in density by about a factor of two. Okay, let's look a little bit at geological context um, in the little bit of time that I have left, because this is kind of cool. If we look at the geologic region that this is happening in, then it looks like this. Um, this is the moon, it's all bashed up. It's a big hunk of rock with a lot of impact craters on it. Uh, the specific region that it looks like all the protons are reflecting from though is here. And if we just zoom in on that a little bit, how big is, uh, each one of these are 15 degrees in latitude and longitude, I believe, so about 500 kilometers by 500 kilometers. So if we zoom in on that, um, 
still looks like a bashed up hunk of rock. Uh, but if you look really close, you might start to see some funny things here. You might start to see a little kind of a, a pale patch here, and maybe here there's a little bit of a, a, a funny thing. It's nothing you would notice if you weren't a geologist. Um, but if I do a color stretch on this, I can make some of these things pop out a little bit more. And what you start to see are these interesting kind of light discolorations on the surface in this region that's reflecting all of the protons. Um, these are examples of what are called lunar swirls. These lunar swirls are all over the moon and they're strongly correlated with magnetic fields. Uh, I'll show you the most famous example of these swirls. This is the Reiner Gamma Formation. Um, looks kind of like uh, cream in a coffee cup or something. Um, but uh, these swirls are located right in regions of strong magnetic fields. Um, there are a number of hypotheses for their origin. One is cometary impacts, which is a little exotic. One is something to do with dust motion in these magnetic fields, which I also don't believe. Uh, the one that I think is right is that this is just an imprint of the fact that this region here has been completely shielded from the solar wind. And so the solar wind is a darkening agent. Solar wind has darkened these regions around here, um, but it has left this kind of cookie cutter where this whole region has been shielded from the solar wind uh, by these magnetic fields. Okay, so the magnetic fields have cool uh, effects on the surface. They affect the interaction of the solar wind with the surface, but they do more than that. They seem to form something which looks a little bit like a shock. And uh, you notice I put quotations on limb shocks because this is a, a point of great disagreement in the literature, whether these are in fact shocks. In fact, uh, no such an, uh, an authority than uh, Chris Russell said, there is no evidence that the plasma is shocked on passage through these features. Uh, and that was true with the measurements that he had because he didn't have very good plasma measurements. All he really had was a magnetometer. But with the magnetometer, what you saw was that as you, as you flew over certain regions of the moon, you suddenly saw a whopping big increase in the magnetic field. And that big increase in the magnetic field was way too big to just be a direct measurement of the crustal field. At these altitudes, that would have been, you know, one nanotesla or so, but you're seeing these big sudden 10 to 20 nanotesla jumps over and over and over again. And you would see it on many consecutive orbits. So these are consecutive orbits around the same region of the moon going around the equator. So the geometry would look something like this, coming across the night side through the shadow. Uh, and you see this big amplification in the magnetic field just as you exit the shadow. So the question is, what the heck are these features? Are they shocks? Are they compressions? Are they something else? Um, not completely a settled question yet. You could ask yourself, I mean, what really is a shock? Um, I've been thinking about this now for a couple of years, and I'm completely confused about what a shock is. Um, but these are some things that you might write down uh, that uh, a shock might have to have going on. You could say that it, would, it has to be some kind of a discontinuity. There has to be mass flux across that discontinuity. Typically, there has to be something like a compression. And typically, there has to be some kind of uh, dissipation or heating or entropy change. There has to be something that's non-reversible about it to make it a shock. And finally, down here, where it's cut off here. But typically, in a shock, you'd have a change in velocity uh, across that shock. So um, this is not a, a comprehensive list of things that describe a shock. And you could, you could argue about whether each one of these is necessary. Um, but it's you know, at least the start of a list that you might write down. We see all of these with Artemis. So uh, this is actually the same orbit of data that I just showed you a minute ago, but I'm showing you a lot more quantities now. This is the uh, ion energy. So the red stripe across here is the solar wind. The yellow stripe above it is doubly ionized helium. This is an angular spectrum corresponding to that. And what you see here is here's the solar wind coming right out from the sun as it's supposed to. Um, and then here's all this other stuff. This is the diffuse reflection of solar wind from the surface. This is the 0.1 to 1%. And then when you get near the strong magnetic anomaly, you see this much higher uh, uh, level of reflection. That's the kind of 30% reflection from the magnetic anomaly. And then look what happens here. Right here, this bright red beam hops over an angle bend. 
Those angle bends are 22 and a half degrees. That corresponds to a significant change in the flow direction of the solar wind. As you do that, you can look at the electrons, the electron temperature. You can see heating in the electrons. Uh, you can see abundant plasma wave activity. This is a uh, power spectrum of the plasma waves, and there's a lot going on there. So there's dissipation in the form of plasma waves. The electrons are heated from about 10 electron volts or 100,000 Kelvin up to about three times that value. There is compression. The density measured by the probe near the moon jumps up by a factor of two and a half. The one upstream doesn't change at all. There is a change in the velocity of about uh, 70 or 80 kilometers per second, and there's a big feature in the magnetic field. So we remind you of the, the geometry of this. This again is the trajectory going across here. This is where all the reflected protons are coming out from this little magnetic anomaly. And if you look at the solar wind flow before and after you go across this, solar wind flow before you cross this structure is just going anti-sunward the way you expect it to go. Then you cross this discontinuity and the solar wind flow goes outward from the moon. It gets deflected out from this structure. And, uh, the change in the velocity uh, normal to that structure is something like uh, 75 kilometers per second or so. So it's an appreciable deflection in the velocity. Is it a shock? Well, it depends on whether you think that a shock has to be macroscopic in scale or not. Um, if you accept that there can be a shock which is small compared to plasma scales, then maybe this can be a shock. Um, but if you if your condition for a shock is that it has to be macroscopic many plasma scales across, then it's probably not. Um, this is not the only case we have. Here's another case which uh, is much higher altitude. The previous case we were at 30 kilometers. This one we're at about 500 kilometers in radius. So we're pretty far away from the moon and we can still see uh, significant effects of this structure that is forming near the moon. Again, there's uh, a, shift, a shift in the velocity, there's heating, there is compression in both the density and the magnetic field, all hallmarks of perhaps a shock. The geometry of this guy looks a little bit different, and I'm going to finish up in one more slide after this. Uh, geometry of this guy looks a little bit different. Now, if you look at where the reflected uh, particles are going, um, they're following trajectories that look something like this. And uh, our trajectory across this looks something like this. And if you uh, do some shock analysis, you can find that there is a quote unquote shock surface that looks like this. Upstream of that, we've got the solar wind velocity. And downstream of that, it's been deflected out um, as you cross this surface. And the interesting thing is that if you trace this inferred surface back, it goes right to this point where all the magnetic anomalies are getting reflected by these strong magnetic fields. So just show a, uh, a simulation for context, and then, uh, then we'll call it good and I'll take questions. Um, what may be happening, we believe, is that the interaction with these reflected protons is really uh, what is driving this shock. So this is a cut through in two uh, uh, orthogonal planes of the magnetic field magnitude, the total proton density, and just the density of the reflected protons. And what you'll see here is that where you get this very high density of reflected protons right here, that seems to launch uh, a compressional feature, uh, which is evident both in the density, in this kind of uh, red color here, and in the magnetic field here. So what we seem to be seeing is that um, these very strong magnetic field regions can form something that, depending on your predilections, you might or might not call a shock, uh, but it certainly forms a feature which extends well downstream and perturbs uh, the environment around the moon globally. So uh, I'm going to skip over a couple slides here in the interest of time and just wrap up. And I will say that lunar magnetic fields are really neat. Um, despite the fact that they're really small, uh, seemingly so small they shouldn't do anything, they have significant effects for the surface, they shield portions of the surface, they produce something which is perhaps transitional to a shock, 
perhaps the smallest collisionless shocks in the solar system if you believe that they are actually shocks. And they're a wonderful physics laboratory for doing plasma physics. Thank you very much, and I will happily entertain questions. Yeah, um, so Artemis has a hard time seeing something like that. We've tried. We've tried to use similar techniques that Cassini did, where you look at uh, basically RF signals on the antennae that are produced by dust impacts. The problem is the orbital velocity, because the, the lunar orbital velocity is only a couple kilometers per second compared to you know 10 or so kilometers per second, I think, for Cassini. So we just don't get enough kinetic energy out of a dust impact to see it. Um, but uh, our little brother, Laddie, which was a, a very small mission that was just up there a couple years ago, had a dedicated dust sensor on it, which was you know, not some poor man's you know, antenna that was meant to do something else, but an actual dust detector. And they did detect dust around the moon. Um, there is a significant dust exosphere around the moon, uh, which is formed by micrometeorite bombardment. So there's enough interplanetary junk floating around that hits the moon regularly enough that it generates some lofted dust, essentially, that follows ballistic trajectories. It seems well, to be... I, I, one of the questions, the reason I was asking it, one of the aspects of the dust that's in this environment, it should be charging up. Mm -hmm. I and mean, it should be, um, in many ways, deflected or interacted with that magnetic dust. And so is there a sense of that from this lofty measurement? What we have seen of the density of that dust is that it's probably not significant enough that it's um, contributing significantly to the plasma interaction, <coughs> but, but certainly the physics you're speaking of should happen. That dust should get lofted up, it should charge up, and then it should feel electric and magnetic fields. It should basically behave like a really heavy pickup ion. We, we haven't yet been able to point to a consequence of that in the observations, but uh, uh, it's certainly an interesting uh, thing to think about. Certainly at Enceladus, uh, the dust plays a huge role in the charge balance. Well, at Enceladus, the, the effective charge density of the dust is comparable to the plasma. So yeah, <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, you talked about the solar wind interaction. Some of the time, the moon is in the magnetosphere, particularly in the tail region. Mm -hmm. Is there any difference in any of this stuff? There is all kinds of differences in the tail region because uh, when you go back in the tail, the flow is not necessarily supersonic anymore. Um, so all of the basic wake picture changes. The other thing that happens in the tail, which is quite cool, is that uh, in the lobe, at least, the plasma density produced from the lunar atmosphere can exceed that of the ambient plasma. So you can actually, in a sense, have a lunar ionosphere that dominates over the ambient plasma. Uh, and you know, actually has macroscopic effects on what the field lines are doing and things like that. It's very low beta plasma, though, so you know, it's not doing huge things to the fields, but it is measurable. A global electrostatic interaction that would actually perturb the orbit of the moon? Yeah, what's wrong with that? Well, what's the, what's the force and what would make it all in one direction instead of something that canceled out, I guess? It's just this factor of 10 to the 39. That the electrostatic force is 10 to the 39 times larger than the gravitational force, proton the proton. Okay, but so the... It, it's, yeah, I discovered that the general relativity of gravity people never think about that. <laughs> and I, I hope the plasma people would, I keep asking the question. So 
So now you have an idea of what the total charge is going to be. You could do that calculation. Uh, the, the surface charge density associated with this charging is, is very small. I mean, your average chunk of regolith has much less than an electron on it. Um, but you'd have to you know, integrate that over the whole surface area of the moon. Yeah, I, can I, I think I saw uh, the order of uh, 100 millivolts per meter. Is that what this on your graph is there for the electric field? Uh, well, the electric field in uh, at, at 30 kilometers is like that's probably not unreasonable. The electric field right at the surface is bigger than that. In the photoelectron sheath, it's you know one to ten volts per meter, but that's a you know over a divide length, say. So from that we can get the charge on the moon. Yep. It's going to be there. I think it's still going to be, I think if you calculate the total charge versus the total mass, you're going to get a heavily disparate ratio in the other direction. I don't know whether that comes out to be 10 to the 39 or what it comes out to be, but one could do this calculation. Pop quiz for me. do that calculation. If it's an anonymous magnetic field, then why the small region of the moon? Mm -hmm. Is there anything else that's special about them? You said they, they, they shield a little bit. There are a few other things that show up in the observations. Um, one, one thing, as I showed, is that the, the surface regolith is, is altered um, optically. Um, but if you look at uh, other measurements of that regolith, another thing that you find is that those regions have anomalous um, uh, hydroxyl content. So they have different amounts of OH emission compared to the surrounding regions. And that may be part and parcel of the same coin, that there's been less protons implanted in that surface that are having reactions and forming OH. But that's another anomalous thing about those regions that people have commented on in recent years. In terms of uh, you know, geological context, uh, a lot of times those regions just don't look very different than their surroundings. But the, the surficial layer, at least, has been altered. Well, at least we know where to put the moon, lunar face now, right? In the shielded area. Uh, except that solar wind's not really all that dangerous. 